course. I have a, the, uh, the honor of introducing my friend and colleague, Dr. Joel Gelfand. Uh, I think many of you know Dr. Gelfand, who is a uh, professor of dermatology and epidemiology at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he's also the vice chair of clinical research and the director of the uh, dermatology clinical Stud studies unit there. Um, truly uh, nationally, internationally recognized expert in psoriasis, clinical epidemiology, uh, with a particular uh, focus uh, from a research standpoint uh, at the intersection of cardiovascular disease, psoriasis. Um, we have the pleasure of two um, uh, discussions with Dr. Gelfand, and then we'll take uh, at the end some time for uh, questions. So thank you, Joel. Well, this is my sixth ARS. It's going to be back here. Um, all of you should have an app on your phone that says H P HMP on it. If you don't have the app, could you raise your hand if you need assistance? So in this brief session, we're going to talk about optimizing the therapeutic selection for common comorbidities. Uh, my disclosures are in their packet for you. All right, so uh, I'm, a, I'm a primarily a researcher. I also have a clinic uh, with psoriasis. I primarily see people with psoriasis and psoriatic diseases. Uh, and this is a model I've been working on for the last, say, two decades of my research career. And essentially, the idea is to develop psoriasis, you need to have environmental risk factors, smoking, and actually obesity has lately, lately through, uh, recently, I should say, through Mendelian randomization studies, been shown to be a causal risk factor for developing psoriasis, as well as genetic susceptibility, that develops as a phenotype you're seeing in the center of the slide. Uh, and then you're exposed to the pathophysiology over decades, uh, treatment effects, as well as the burden of living this disease. And, and these things all come together to result in uh, adverse uh, health outcomes for patients. Uh, now, what you need to know is what are the most well-established comorbidities for patients with psoriasis that have the most clinical significance for them. Uh, and this includes cardiometabolic disease, which results in premature mortality, especially in people with more severe disease, diabetes, of course, an inflammatory arthritis, of course, an inflammatory arthritis, mood disorders, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's in particular, and then T-cell lymphoma of the skin, which is uncommon, but if you're a dermatologist manages disease, or if you're a rheumatologist or GI doctor, you know, managing them with a, a drug and their skin is getting worse, you have to keep that in the back of your mind because a lot of our therapies could aggravate that problem. And there's a whole host of emerging comorbidities that seem to be coming up over time. Sleep apnea, uh, adverse infectious disease outcomes, NASH, COPD, uh, chronic and end-stage renal disease, peptic ulcer disease, and sexual dysfunction. And, and to come back to Len's talk earlier before, I'm starting to think of, of inflammatory diseases as sort of like diseases of aging, of accelerated aging, if you will. Because a lot of what we see is that people you know, develop these morbidities earlier in life than you would expect based on how old they are and the other risk factors they have. Um, and so recent guidelines have come out. This is D and PF guidelines. And what you should know is that what our, our approach is, is advising for more intensive screening of traditional cardiovascular risk factors and more intensive management of those in people who have moderate to severe psoriasis or more than 10% of their body surface area involved uh, with the disease because those people are at highest risk of premature mortality and cardiovascular problems. Uh, similarly, the ACC AHA guidelines just came out, and they also, for the first time, recognized psoriasis as being a patient population who should be targeted for more intensive use of statins. Uh, they also uh, include rheumatoid arthritis and people with HIV disease in that same sort of line of thinking. All right, let's briefly talk about screening for psoriatic arthritis. Um, how many people here are dermatologists in the room? Good number of hands. Okay. So to me, the screening is fairly simple. There's a lot of surveys out there. Uh, they're good for research. I typically don't use them in clinical practice. I just like to ask the question, you know, do you have joint pain, swelling, or stiffness? That's what I'm trying to understand, Tori arthritis. On examination, you could often see joints that could be so swollen for your visual inspection. Uh, you could palpate the small joints on the fingers. So I usually press on the DIPs, MCPs, and PIPs with enough pressure on my thumb to make the top third of my thumb turn white. Okay, so if you try on yourself, that's the right amount of pressure to elicit on a joint to feel, uh, to elicit tenderness in a patient who has inflammatory arthritis. And usually what will happen is either they'll wince or they'll pull away. They usually don't scream unless they have sort of fibromyalgia that sort of shifts it towards fibro. So I'm often looking at the patient's face, so I'm feeling for them pulling away. And there's a differential diagnosis. Not all arthritis or joint pr problems in people with psoriasis is psoriatic arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, gout, 
fibromyalgia are common things that commingle uh, in people with psoriasis. And so if I need to do the workup, I may get x-rays of hands and feet if those areas are affected symptomatically. And I may get blood workers for markers of inflammation, rheumatoid factor, and CCP. Symptomatically, I may get blood workers for markers of inflammation, rheumatoid factor, and CCP. And occasionally, I'll pick up patients uh, who have rheumatoid arthritis and not psoriatic arthritis. Those are people who really need to go see the rheumatologist. Uh, they have a different treatment paradigm than what we'll do for PSA. Um, and then also, it's helpful for me triaging a patient who really needs to get to see rheumatology versus someone who probably has a mixed presentation with osteoarthritis or fibro, what have you. All right, uh, uh, briefly, for, 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 uh, since we're a little behind in time, uh, these slides are in your handout. For, for cancer, what you should know is that there's a variety of data out there, some plus, some minus, about psoriasis being related to malignancy. It's sort of a mixed bag. The strongest relationship is really with T-cell lymphoma with about a tenfold higher risk over a lifetime in patients who have psoriasis being treated systemically. So keep an eye out on this. I usually diagnose about four or five cases a year, sometimes more, and people refer to me for psoriasis management. Um, what we should try and do, though, in terms of malignancy is think, uh, looking at presumably healthy psoriasis patients presenting for a clinical trial, a series of trials we're doing in cardiovascular disease where they're getting a PET-CT scan to look at cardiovascular imaging, and 3% of them had a serious life-threatening cancer that was not picked up based on their H&P and lab testing, things of that nature. So when you're first meeting a patient, their highest risk of having cancer is that day you're meeting them. They have a pre prevalent cancer hasn't been picked up yet. So encouraging to be up to date. And then infections, we know that infections are uh, with people with more severe disease, they tend to be more prone to these things. It's a cause of excess mortality. And what I do in my practice is try and encourage people to be up to date with age appropriate vaccinations, including more recently we had the Shingrix vaccine for people 50 or older. It's a killed vaccine, so it's okay to use when people are on immune modulating therapies. This involves uh, understanding the patient's subjective experience with their disease, a detailed patient history, a physical exam, uh, trying to document both the body surface area involved, locations involved. I like to do a global assessment because that helps me follow the patient over time and figure out you know, how my treatment's working for them. And these are chronic diseases. I have people who can look back you know, 10 years and say, well, when I first met you, you had a disease on 50% of your body with a PGA of four. Look how good we're doing now. You know, it helps put perspective on things. Uh, laboratory workup and consultation when indicated and a discussion of patient preferences. So the DLQI is for a research tool you can read here just so you understand the questions that are felt to be relevant uh, psychometrically. In my practice, we assess two simple questions, global questions. My MA asks it. Uh, think about physical symptoms, how bad they are on a scale of zero to two. Think about um, uh, when taking history, I want to know how long they've had it, what their prior treatment has been in their response, because we have so many therapies now that will dictate what I'm going to do next. Uh, their natural history, what makes disease better, what's make it worse. I want to know detail about comorbidities. You have to ask people specifically, have they had cancer? Have they had serious infections or, or prone to candidal yeast infections? Uh, they have tuberculosis or tuberculosis exposure. Uh, have they had demyelinization events or have they had Crohn's or ulcerative colitis? As we all know, a clinician's room, you ask a patient, any medical problems? No, doc. And then they have like a whole long, long laundry list of health problems that they didn't really disclose to you. So you have to ask about these things. Uh, I want to know where they are in the cancer screening and vaccination history and their health behaviors. And then I do a review of systems focusing on joint symptoms in particular. And there's a differential diagnosis you've got to keep in mind. You know, it could be a, a connective tissue disease like dementomyositis or subacute sub lupus. Uh, it could be T cell lymphoma in the skin. Isolated lesions could be squamous cell or basal cell. That's a cell lymphoma in the skin. Isolated lesions could be squamous cell or basal cell. That's a common referral I get from rheumatology. Uh, doc, this patient's joints are great. They had a stubborn part, spot, plaque of psoriasis in their arm. It's not going away. It's a basal cell. Uh, infections like tinea, scabies, syphilis. People just have their hands and feet involved. That could be uh, something called necrolytic acolarthema, caused by hepatitis C, uh, other skin diseases, or most importantly, drug reactions. We don't want to treat uh, psoriasis of biologics if it's being caused by a drug that we can just remove and then cure them. And then for patient preferences, I'm trying to understand what is their tolerance for risk? Uh, what is their preference for oral medications versus injectables versus light therapy? Their financial considerations, convenience, accessibility, uh, their fertility, your pregnancy planning, and their lifestyle, how much alcohol they drink. And we tend to think of it as a dichotomous way. People with localized disease, minimal quality of life impairment, usually we approach with topical. People who have moderate severe disease, a little more extensive, to get into. So there's a 33-year-old single woman with psoriasis affecting most of her scalp, her elbows, her knees, and her fingernails have subungal debris. 
Uh, her body surface area is 5%, her global assessment is 4. So you're getting a sense already that she has mainly her scalp, elbows, knees, really thick lesions, and nail disease. Start at age 15, she complains of itching, but the itching is mild, so she doesn't have a lot of objective symptoms. Uh, she says all of her joints hurt all the time. Uh, she notes severe embarrassments, which is a lot of emotional impairment, and it's hard for her to date. Uh, her disease gets better in the summertime. Uh, she's only used topical treatments, and she notes that she hates needles and once passed out during a blood draw. So her past medical history, she has PCOS. She's uh, obese with a BMI of 31. Her blood pressure is 140 over 90. She has a history of depression and a history of urinary tract infections. Uh, her medication is sertraline. She doesn't smoke. She has two glasses of wine, of, uh, two glasses of wine a night and works as a social media coordinator for the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, and she has sex with men. Multiple Sclerosis Society, and she has sex with men. It's a very uh, millennial job. Social media coordinator is a very millennial job to have. Um, all right, and then her, her paternal grandfather had psoriasis. Her father died at age 52 of an MI. Her brother has Crohn's. So this is a pretty typical case when it comes down to this. case may sound kind of familiar with you. It's a mixture of several patients, but it's pretty typical of how patients present. Um, and uh, I just a quick question by raising hands. How many people think that two glasses of wine a night is heavy drinking for a woman? Any hands for that? How many think that's okay, it's normal drinking, or not to be concerned about? One hand. <laughs> if, you, if you could put your glass down. <laughs> you should raise a glass of wine. To it. So CDC here from Mark Lebel uh, in his uh, postdoc uh, just came out in the JAD not long ago, just summarizing what I try to go through here, uh, different scenarios, different mechanisms, uh, and what the evidence would suggest would be a good place to point. So I'll leave this here for your reference.